All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started with the video first. Now is trying to fight Mike Tyson. He should be doing a lot more movement than he is now. He's allowing Mike Tyson to trap him in the corner. At the Hail Mary right hand, I know I'm going to land it somewhere here. And Tillman never responded at all to Richard Steele's count. <laughs> First of all, in the back, I'd like to thank Johnson Hanson, our computer guru in uh, the Epilepsy Center, who helped me put some of this together. And, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Phil Fastenau came here. He is a neuropsychologist and uh, in charge of our concussion uh, service. Um, and um, again, um, the important thing about this is that what we're seeing here is not unique. And uh, you can just about every Sunday see some of this. Um, and yet the whole issue of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is, uh, as we'll talk about the kind of social aspects of this talk, is pretty new uh, to all of us, uh, although the, certainly the condition uh, had been around for a while. So let's uh, kind of talk a little bit about uh, this, starting off, first of all, with a little bit of history. Before 1927, uh, so there was just no recognition that concussion uh, could produce brain injury, a brain insult. Um, there were some papers in 1927 that started to open the door, uh, and H.S. Martland, who is a neuropathologist, uh, well, a pathologist who did neuropathology at um, in New Jersey and New York, became interested in this. And he uh, was a forensic pathologist as well and had a, a large experience with acute uh, traumatic brain injury had done over 300 autopsies on the brain of individuals who had falls and so forth, not sports injuries. He became interested in boxing uh, and the injuries that might occur of, uh, from boxing and uh, actually evaluated uh, some boxers. One of the five cases that he described was a case with uh, paralysis agitans, i.e. Parkinson's disease uh, of the time. Um, and basically... Uh, he introduced the word punch drunk because it was not known in the medical circles. Uh, as I say, uh, concussion was not recognized uh, at all as producing permanent uh, potential brain injury. Uh, he uh, got the pathology wrong based on his uh, history of the work that he did. He thought it was microvascular insult uh, primarily, but nonetheless he did a great service by opening the door. And publications started to appear uh, by 1937, a, uh, a Milpa, Jay Milpa, was a lieutenant in the Navy and a physician um, watching naval boxing, uh, decided that there were some things that he could recommend to change some of the rules of boxing that might protect the head more. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do with boxing. I mean, the whole nature of boxing, uh, and now mixed martial arts, is to damage your opponent's brain. I mean, that's the ultimate, uh, uh, the duty of the boxer. And he introduced the term dementia pugilistica, which exists to this day. Um, again, it's hard to know who used the word chronic traumatic encephalopathy first. Actually, uh, uh, Martlin in his paper talked about chronic traumatic encephalitis uh, uh, concussion, slash concussion, one of the headings in his paper. Uh, but McDonald Critchley, who was an eminent neurologist of the last 30 years of the 20th century and an essayist uh, in England, uh, appears, at least from uh, what others have said and what I could see, coined the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and a, a paper, Punch Drunk Syndrome, the Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy of Boxers, uh, an essay. Um, however, it wasn't until 1973 that really... Uh, 
a, an extremely important pathologic study uh, uh, was reported, 15 boxers that had brain autopsies. And uh, at that point, um, the authors uh, talked about uh, the result of, the, of that injury, the punch drunk injury, dementia pugilistica, was really a degenerative change and, quote, protein deposition, end of quote, which becomes essential, not that microvascular hemorrhages. Um, so if we uh, start with uh, concussions, um, the definition here comes from the Latin uh, concussio. It's always sort of de rigueur to put up a slide like this. And uh, the definition, again, is to, from the word was to strike or shake violently. And the accepted neurologic definition is uh, that it's a neurocognitive or behavioral dysfunction resulting from a biomechanically induced alteration of brain physiology. You shake the brain, okay? Uh, and of course, as I think most of you know, uh, it doesn't require a loss of concussion to make a definition or, or to make a diagnosis of concussion. And where this, of course, becomes such a critical issue is looking at all those videos of, um, of hits in uh, football and the NFL, it's sometimes hard to know a uh, subtle ding injury, particularly up uh, uh, not until just recently uh, when some of the rules have changed and finally uh, the NFL has had to back down. Uh, and uh, now there are more skilled physicians that are evaluating uh, uh, individuals. But still, uh, the issue here is that brain injury can probably result from sub-concussion hits, um, as we'll talk about. Uh, so what are the symptoms? Again, most of you know who've seen these cases, uh, as I have, headache, dizziness, in all of its forms, vertigo, lightheadedness, uh, nausea, confusion, memory impairment, imbalance, behavioral changes, again, are pretty familiar. And this is some of the language uh, that is used in um, traumatic encephalopathy circles. Again, chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, is a, a long-term neurological consequences of repetitive, mild TBIs, traumatic brain injuries. Keep in mind, and I'll say this several times, this is a pathological diagnosis because the clinical symptomatology and the pathological diagnosis, the dots have not been fully connected, um, as we'll talk about. Of course, dementia pugilistica, already mentioned, chronic post-concussion syndrome lasting one year, um, this certainly exists. And one of the more famous uh, cases right now is Michael Orr who became uh, famous in the movie that Sandra Bullock uh, won an Academy Award for. Um, he uh, was injured um, in uh, a game earlier this year and has not played since. And, of course, uh, he's looked down upon uh, uh, for not being man enough to continue to play. Um, then, of course, uh, uh, post-traumatic dementia, the result of a single TBI. Uh, that's, again, terminology used in that light. Post-traumatic cognitive impairment, which is, again, mild cognitive impairment as a result of uh, TBI. Uh, these are the kind of things we're seeing and reading about all the time in the military now with these bomb blasts and then the waves of force that pass through the head and lead to brain damage. Uh, and then, of course, post-traumatic Parkinson's disease uh, said to be more common in boxers. And, of course, Muhammad Ali is one of the more famous examples of that who uh, lived with uh, uh, Parkinson's uh, presumed post-traumatic Parkinson's disease, although he never had an autopsy, so it's not absolutely certain. Um, the um, history, then, the popularization of CTE is a very recent story uh, and really begins only about 12 years ago. Uh, there really wasn't much talk about this. Everybody knew about dementia pugilistica, but there certainly wasn't much talk about this. There was literature that was... An, an observations that were starting to come out uh, about uh, possible injuries uh, in sports uh, other than um, boxing, uh, basically in uh, contact sports. So Mike Webster, uh, some of you around here may remember him, he was a center for the Pittsburgh Steelers of the NFL. A picture of him um, in his uh, younger days. Um, he was undersized at six foot one, 255 pounds, um, he played at Wisconsin and uh, was a highly regarded player. He was drafted by uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers and played uh, for them for 15 seasons 
uh, from 74 to 90, 245 NFL, uh, NFL games played. And he was elected to the NFL uh, Hall of Fame in 1997, and many consider him the best center who ever played the game. Um, uh, in an interview I heard uh, him uh, give early in his career, just happened to hear it and remember it because it was just um, so shocking, and that is he estimated that in his football career, high school, college, and the NFL, uh, he had 25,000 full body contacts with an opposing player, including practice. Because in those days, back in high school, which I can remember, uh, it was a six-foot plank was put out, and a player at each end of that, and the trick, uh, the, uh, uh, the object was to knock the other player off. Uh, so there was a lot of full body uh, contact. Some of that's being changed with new rules, as some of you, I think, know. Um, Shortly after retirement, probably even before, he started to develop amnesia, depression, and went on to progressive cognitive de decline. And he was recognized as being a very intelligent uh, uh, fellow uh, by his uh, colleagues. And in fact, uh, finished his career and for a short time before he couldn't do it anymore, was a coach uh, for, I think, the um, Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and basically, he can, uh, became so um, impaired, his marriage broke up, uh, uh, he lost all of his money. Um, and at one point, uh, he was living homeless uh, in cars uh, and in people who would pick him up and take him to their apartment. He was almost kind of wandering around for large periods of time in Pittsburgh. He didn't live there. He lived in Wisconsin. But his wife basically had to divorce him at that point because he was becoming uh, dangerous. Um, he, uh, there were uh, finally the NFL recanted, and he was uh, evaluated uh, uh, before that by four uh, clinicians who indicated that he was disabled. Um, the NFL uh, resisted it, but finally they consulted uh, Ted Westbrook. Uh, those of you who have been around here a while know, was a member of our department of neurology for many, many years, and still uh, is, uh, works part time in our residence clinic with me. Um, he reviewed the application and agreed that he was disabled, and he was awarded something over a million dollars. Um, uh, not much of that was uh, uh, delivered. Uh, this story is, uh, you can uh, hear this, anybody who wants more detail, in the, the CBS Frontline series in 2013 uh, did a piece called The League of Denial, uh, the NFL's concussion crisis. Thank For Iron Mike. TV interviews became impossible. No, I'm talking about... No, I'm just trying to find... Yeah, well, trauma, everybody went through trauma as a kid. I'm not a kid. I was different than that. I'm just saying... The things we do to one another, okay, Hell, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just tired and confused right now. That's why I say I, I can't really, I can't say it the way I want to say it. I could, I could say I could answer this real easy at, at other times, but right now I'm just tired. Mm -hmm. Um, basically. In early 2000 uh, uh, decade, he died of an MI at the age of um, um, sorry, uh, about at the age of uh, 50, uh, and um, it just so happened, uh, and probably the reason he died of an MI was he was using huge amounts of Ritalin uh, to basically try to stay awake and as uh, alerting, not, not so much from the uh, drug abuse potential, but it was uh, for, quote, medicinal purposes, if you will. Um, he uh, basically, uh, his body was brought into um, the uh, Allegheny uh, for, uh, pathology uh, uh, section of county coroner's office, and a Bennett Umalu happened to be on duty. He was a much-trained uh, uh pathologist and doing neuropathology as well. Um, he was Nigerian by birth and knew nothing about Mike Webster, knew nothing about football, because uh, this is well after the career of uh, 
of uh, Mike Western ended. And basically, uh, he performed the autopsy and he recognized there's something wrong with this guy's head. And what he didn't do is he didn't cut the brain Im uh, immediately, which is often done in forensic pathology circles. The brain's not preserved. It takes too much time. It's too costly on time. So he preserved the brain and cut it later. Um, and he, uh, because of his background, recognized that there was a serious problem uh, with his brain. He recognized the pathology was something he hadn't seen before. Um, and he, uh, not having any uh, academic reputation himself at that point, um, was smart enough, so he's in Pittsburgh, goes to the uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Hamilton is a pathologist there, and he looked at this and uh, made the point that this could be the end of football. Um, and so they both took it to Stephen Dukoski, who I know, and was a, a chairman of the Department of Neurology at that point, and an eminent researcher in Alzheimer's disease. He's now uh, the uh, uh, dean of the medical school at the uh, University of Virginia. In any event, uh, they recognized at first thought this was a new disorder, but with research recognized that they had rediscovered neuropathological changes in CT for CTD. Um, and this was uh, presented in a paper, Omalo, Dukoski, Menster, and others. Uh, and as you can read here, uh, in neurosurgery in 2005. So this really is where I've spent so much time on this. This is what really changes things social, socially. Um, he uh, was, uh, NFL went after him. There was a committee in the NFL called the MTBI Committee, the Minimal Traumatic Brain Injury Committee. And basically what they were doing was writing papers saying concussion doesn't injure the brain and actually put out a series of papers uh, to that effect. Um, he, uh, uh, and in fact, the committee uh, called for a retraction of the paper, uh, indicating that this was just not correct. And Dukoski wrote a letter to the neurosurgeon and recognized there was no reason to retract the paper. Okay. Um, so the story, there's much tumult now. This was in the news. Um, and then Terry Long comes along. And Terry Long was a retired NFL Pittsburgh Steeler player, uh, uh, that in 2005 killed himself uh, by uh, 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 drinking antifreeze. Um, and again, um, he was an undersized player at 5 foot 11 inches, 280 pounds. He was a guard and played actually next to, uh, to Webster. So there's a terrible close proximity situation here. Um, Omalu again <coughs> did the autopsy, uh, preserved the brain and found evidence of severe chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We'll talk about pathology later. Um, and they published a second paper, uh, basically the same group, Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy in a National Football Player, Part 2. Okay. So, again, the MTBI committee and the NFL is going wild. There's all sorts of denial. They literally, uh, uh, for several reasons, but one of them is that uh, Lamalo was actually driven out of Pittsburgh. Um, and again, um, um, this became, uh, as I said, a, uh, uh, an amazing story that you can actually see in two places. You can go see the uh, PBS League of Denial, and you remember the movie in 2015, Concussion, with uh, Will Smith, who played Umalu, um, and Eddie Marsden, who played Stephen Dukoski, and there were other uh, well-known actors in it as well. Not a very good movie, but actually <laughs> it was pretty accurate. Uh, and anybody who wants to read more about what was happening kind of from the social side and how he was being kind of driven out of business. He was uh, had issues with a visa and needed a full-time job, so he ends up becoming the chief medical examiner where he is to this day in San Joaquin Valley, uh, Central Valley, uh, in Lodi and he's the Associate Clinical Professor at the University of California in Davis. Um, but he's not out of this yet, as you'll see, because there's a paper as recently as in November of this year with his name on it, or of 2017. Um, so and this is also the book, The League of Denial, written by a couple of ESPN authors who were considered quite brave because of the money that is at play. And the money is incredible, and that's why there's so much action. Keep in mind that the... 2014 to 2022 NFL contract just for the Sunday games, uh, uh, afternoon and evening, is like $23 billion. 
Okay. And the Thursday game, night game, there was a new contract signed on, for I'm not how many years, like eight billion dollars. So the money here is huge. Uh, the uh, 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 the uh, director of the NFL, uh, um, uh, Goodall, as you know, Roger Goodall, makes thirty four million dollars a year. Okay, big money at play. That's almost as much money as uh, we make. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and five lifetimes. Uh, so where does the thing change, both socially and medically, that kind of keeps this thing going? Because it's really hot right about now. Um, in I think it was about 2007 uh, to 2009, uh, our Kassin uh, neurologist became the chairman of the MTBI committee. And he became known as Dr. No. Because whenever asked anything in an interview, does football do this to you? No. Does football cause concussions? No. Does football cause brain injury? No. You know, this kind of this concussion's bad for you? No. So he became known as Dr. No. Um, then uh, the scene changes because this fellow Christopher Nowinski uh, is uh, a Harvard graduate, played football at Harvard uh, as a tackle, and uh, unlike most Harvard graduates, went on to professional wrestling. Uh, and uh, became interested in injuries and actually wrote a book about some of the uh, injuries and what happens to these people and got committed. And he actually worked with Omalu. And what he was doing was going out and getting brains. Now, again, sounds sort of tawdry, uh, but uh, as started to happen, the information started spreading through circles and the wives of these players started understanding and hearing what's happening and still do. The latest... Uh, a uh, uh, piece I read from an, um, a wife of a fellow by the name of Kelly who was a football player was in February earlier this month in the New York Times. So this is a very ongoing thing. Um, and they became disenchanted with each other. Uh, and so Nowinski and his Sports Legacy Institute, which basically is a brain collecting service, uh, goes to Boston and through connections there uh, meets up with Anne McKee. Um, uh, and uh, she uh, is a neuropathologist and has an interesting history. Well, she was a medical student at Case Western Reserve University, did a residency in neurology at Metro, and then went on in, uh, to being a neuropathologist. Um, so uh, basically they uh, lined up together, and Nowinski uh, went out and started collecting brains and has collected a lot of brains. Uh, and others are playing. Uh, the NIH is involved in this as well because the um, NFL turned away, from, obviously, from Omalu, then turned away to some extent from the Boston group at Boston University and um, has been sending brains uh, uh, to the NIH now that they've had to admit uh, 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 some involvement. As you recall, that a few years ago there was a settlement uh, uh, with players in a lawsuit for about $750 million uh, for injured players. Uh, Mike Webster isn't qualified because this is only for people after 2006. And, of course, he died and his, the paper was published in 2005. Um, so let's just, now that we look at kind of the social history that gets us to where we are and has opened uh, sort of uh, uh, this to our consciousness uh, as physicians but also to the consciousness of the public, um, so we look at, again, it's important to keep in mind, these are collected brains. They're going out. There's a biased population. These, are, these been, people are disturbed. The wives are dying. They're committing suicide. And the wives are calling them up and turning their brains over. So this is not any kind of a, a double-blind uh, uh, controlled study. It's uh, all retrospective. So there, the clinical traumatic and uh, clinical disconnect uh, with chronic traumatic encephalopathy still exists although I think we all realize uh, that there's a strong connection. Um, it is certainly the working hypothesis uh, that, it, that the generation of CTE is producing. So what are the things that makes people susceptible, makes uh, contact sports players susceptible? Certainly the length of time uh, of exposure to recurrent head trauma is a big issue. The frequency, of course, of subclinical uh, traumas along with the concussions that they might have. The age of onset, and this is very important. And also, presumably, and this is broadly accepted or not fully proven, there is uh, very likely a genetic predisposition because there are certainly players that have had very violent careers who haven't developed uh, 
the clinical pictures that are probably associated with CTE. So again, there has been an established, this comes out of Boston, uh, the um, symptom staging. Uh, staging is always difficult because uh, you don't have to go classically from one, two, three, four. And you can read this headache, decreased attention span, and concentration at the beginning, stage two, depression, mood swings, headache, short-term memory loss, stage three, again, more of the same, memory loss, executive dysfunction, the frontal lobes start to be impacted, explosivity, visual spatial impairment, aggressive behaviors, apathy. Uh, so there can be this back and forth uh, between apathy and explosive behavior. Stage four, again, severe cognitive impairment, memory loss, language disturbances, Parkinson's features. And what's not mentioned in the clinical um, uh, staging is there's probably a connection with um, ALS, progressive uh, uh, motor neuron disease as well. Uh, that is a frontal lobe subtype uh, with dementia. Um, so again, it's problematic. And, people can come in at different levels. Uh, the younger uh, the impact, the more it tends to be neurobehavioral. Uh, the later the impact, so people who develop problems in their 60s and so forth, it tends to be more the cognitive decline, the dementia. Um, so uh, uh, an important paper, and a lot of this is very recent. This 2017 came out in September. I'm not even sure, in fact, it was released one of the nature uh, journals. Uh, I'm not even sure it's hit paper yet, probably has. Um, and this is the age of first exposure, FAE, and neurobiological deterioration. This is kind of a scary uh, paper uh, for those of you who have young male children or plan on having children. They looked at 200 and former, uh, 214 former American football players in the Legend Data Bank. This is a data bank that comes out of uh, Boston Again, it's uh, anybody can enter it who's done uh, contact sports. Uh, they're collecting data. Um, uh, it's out on websites and so forth. And then there are telephone interviews and online testing that you can do. So it has all the problems of collecting data uh, retrospectively in that way. Um, it's, uh, it stands for uh, the longitudinal uh, examination to gather uh, information uh, or gather data of neurodegenerative diseases. It's kind of hard to press into a, a meaningful word, but there it is. Um, and basically, to cut to the chase here, what they did was uh, they divided at age 12 uh, individuals who played contact football, Pop Warner football, or the Little League of football, uh, before age 12, compared to people who started playing after age 12, mainly high school. Um, and what they discovered uh, when they compared the two groups is there's a doubling uh, of the increased odds for impairment in behavioral regulation, apathy, and executive dysfunction, okay, and these kids who begin uh, playing early. Uh, and then there's three times increased odds of developing depression. Even the NFL is saying you probably shouldn't play tackle football until at least high school. Um, and, you know, I've watched videos, uh, I didn't bring them here, of little kids running into each other and being knocked unconscious, you know, like they're 10 years old. Um, keep in mind, as an aside, helmets don't work. There was this big um, issue uh, uh, seven, eight years ago coming out with a new concussion-proof helmet. Rydell put it out, and, of course, that doesn't work uh, because the problem here is movement of the head, not uh, the direct impact. It might help prevent skull fractures, but it's not going to help prevent uh, concussion in that sense. Um, now, flipping from the clinical to the pathology here out of the same group, and McKee's name is on both of these papers, this is a look at um, autopsies of 202 deceased former football players, i.e. the collection of brains that they've looked at. And uh, keep in mind there are others out there. This isn't all uh, the autopsied individuals. Um, and they looked uh, at uh, uh, levels of play. They only had two that were pre-high school players that didn't play beyond that. There was no injury there, uh, no problem, no, no CT on pathology, I should say. No 14 high school players, three of them, 21%, had uh, mild CTE, M for mild, S for severe. Mild is the first two stages, which I haven't showed you, uh, and severe uh, stage three. Uh, then we go up, 53 college players, 
48, 91% had evidence of uh, CTE uh, ranging from mild to severe, as you could say. Semi-pro, which isn't a huge number of people, a uh, small number of cases, 9 of 14 uh, with uh, CTE at autopsy. Eight Canadians, which is basically the NFL of uh, Canada, Canada. Uh, no surprise here, 88%. And then there are the NFLs, 111 autopsies. 110, about 99.45%, whatever that is, have uh, CTE, most of those, as you can read, severe, okay? Um, so uh, this is where the NFL, you know, they were fighting this kind of stuff and so forth. Uh, they actually at one point uh, uh, gave this uh, uh, Boston Center money, but they've now kind of moved to the NFL. Uh, and this occurred at the time of Junior Seau, Remember in 2015, he put a 357 Magnum in, uh, at his chest and killed himself. And he had been, again, one of the most consummate and one of the best linebackers ever to play the game. And he uh, was a violent player. He was not undersized at about 265 pounds, um, very, very fast. And uh, he, again, was a really good guy and then deteriorated afterward, lost most of his money, he lost his family, and died. There was a fight over the brain, and Amalu actually contacted uh, when he heard about the, him dying and was uh, called down with Stanley Prusner. And Stanley Prusner won the Nobel Prize for his work on prion disease, so it was a pretty high level. Um, he's at Stanford. And they, uh, he went down and autopsied the brain. The NFL stepped in at that point, convinced the family that this guy was nuts and that they needed to send the brain to uh, NIH. So at least it went to NIH. And again, he had severe CTE, just as an aside. Uh, so this is pretty damning statistics and numbers here. And here's just a breakdown. And again, the numbers don't really help you very much because, sure, there's more linemen because there's more linemen on the field at one time. Eight to nine linemen out of the 22 players were on the field. But uh, the one that bothers me the most, if you ever watch football, uh, was uh, the uh, quarterbacks. I mean, those guys are standing still, uh, often blindsided, uh, going back to the Michael Orr movie, and um, just get hammered. And uh, as a, a result, it's no surprise that you're seeing a number of them uh, in these studies. Um, so if you look at the gross pathology, um, it's not as pronounced. And actually, Michael Webster's brain, there wasn't much to see in gross pathology. Um, Generally, though, when you look at large numbers, and again, this is uh, out of the key series, of low bar atrophy, about 36% uh, have frontal lobe, uh, temporal lobe, you can read the numbers, 31% parietal lobe, 22 thinning of the corpus callosum, uh, white matter structure, cavum septum pellucidum, this is the structure that separates the lateral ventricles, and I'll show you, and the cavum means that it's a cavitation, it's a spreading, and it comes from just the force field of the trauma, which damages that. Uh, the power of the substantia nigra, of course, is where the Parkinson's uh, disease uh, <coughs> certainly uh, has some origin. And this is a look um, at the uh, brain. Again, uh, normal brain up here. Uh, and this is the brain of a University of Texas football player who died in 2015 at the age of 66. Um, he was an unusual fellow. Uh, he was an All-American, uh, a huge lineman who graduated from University of Texas with a fine arts degree and went on and got a master's of fine arts and was a recognized painter, uh, a regional painter. And this I just threw up as some of the work that he was doing. Um, and basically he developed a progressive dementing illness and died. His brain uh, uh, was autopsied and showed uh, profound CTE. And basically what we're seeing here is enlargement of the lateral ventricles. So this is a kind of atrophy. And at least right here you see that little but that's the cave and septum pellucidum from the forces that are created from the fluid dynamics around that structure, uh, and also the widening of the sulci. Um, so a picture of atrophy, and his brain also showed advanced uh, microscopic changes of CTE. Um, and now, see, what, the, what are the microscopic changes? Um, and this is what uh, Omalu and others have seen. Um, this is actually... Uh, uh, and Hernandez's brain, um, uh, the uh, 
the player for uh, First Florida and then for uh, the New England Patriots who played uh, was highly regarded after three years and then got involved in a murder situation, was in jail and hung himself earlier last year. And uh, basically what McKee, who cut the brain, uh, indicated it was the worst CTE she has seen in anybody his age. He's only 27. And so how much of his behavioral stuff is related to CT, of course, this has to be left up to you because the dots haven't been collected, connected. But basically what you're seeing is a lots and lots of neurofibrillary tangles. And there are lots of diseases, the tauopathies that produce this. The difference here is, and it's kind of hard to see at this distance, is that the protein deposition tends to be deep in the sulci and largely in the cortex, uh, unlike many of the other tauopathies. Okay. But it is, uh, as I'll show you, where things start to connect. Um, so in the microscopic pathology, you're seeing a series of things that you can read here. But the main thing is a tau deposition in the form of neurofibrillary tangles and astrocytic tangles. And if you read up on Alzheimer's disease, you hear some of these same terms, um, which is also a tauopathy. Uh, and it's around intracortical blood vessels. It tends to be very vascular. And again, maximum in the cortex in the depths of the sulci. It's a unique, you have no other tauopathy does this. It uh, also can be seen with degenerative changes in tauopathy elsewhere. And in people who have stage three and four, you can see beta amyloid. You can see alpha synuclein uh, deposits, which are, uh, which is the protein seen in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, and TDP43, which is uh, also commonly seen, is the uh, Protonopathy associated with uh, ALS. Okay. And then here is a pathological uh, staging I uh, mentioned before, and I'll be brief for the sake of time. Basically, what you're seeing is increased numbers of neurofibrillary tangles in these uh, CT lesions, which are a combination of uh, neuro, uh, neurofibrillary tangles and uh, other aspects of degenerative change. Um, scattered throughout the brain, um, and um, basically uh, building up. Uh, and so stage three and four is the late onset that we referred to in that paper, uh, or the severe, and stage one and two, without going over in great detail, was in uh, the milder forms. Um, so what is tau? And again, just to be brief, um, it's uh, a protein that normally binds to microtubules and and is represented or produced uh, uh, on an identified gene on chromosome 17. It's 32 amino acids that have several different repeat forms, the 3R and 4R repeats. And basically the tauopathy is a state of hyperphosphorylation that leads to microtubular uh, destabilization, as you can read, and an accumulation of this tau protein, the tangles. Um, and the clinical subtype, as I already mentioned, of the, all these tau, tau opathies is determined by the species of tau, whether it's 3R or 4R, uh, that accumulates to the distribution of that accumulation, where it uh, occurs. And um, again, a list of the known tau opathies and the distribution, for example, Alzheimer's disease, mostly temporal parietal lobe, and you go down the list with cortical basal degeneration, a lot of involved basal ganglia, frontal temp uh, <coughs> temporal lobar degeneration, the tau subtype, uh, which the behavioral variant of, of uh, frontal uh, 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 temporal uh, lobar dementia looks a lot like CTE clinically. Uh, Pick's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, finally Down syndrome. Remember, all of these uh, cases go on to develop Alzheimer's just about if they live long enough. Um, and again, the pathology here in distribution is always difficult, but emotional mobility probably connects with the old behavioral brain, the cingulate gyrus, um, hippocampus, parahippocampus, interrhinal cortex, um, thalamus. The memory disturbance, probably hippocampal interrhinal cortex, where memories are, memories are laid down. This executive symptoms, obviously, from the uh, and subjacent white matter in the Parkinson's mentioned from involvement in substantia and acra, plus other basal ganglion structures. Um, what's the mechanism? Um, again, it's not, you know, the hit and you have a helmet on and you're okay. It's basically, as you can see from a lot of those plays, it's acceleration, deceleration. Um, how fast you go forward and how fast you stop. Because the brain has the 
consistency, as I mentioned earlier, of warm gelatin. And it just doesn't do really well when your head is banged around a lot because yeah, the brain is moving around and things are happening. You get, <coughs> it is thought that lateral impacts are worse than frontal impacts, creating the shearing forces um, and the fluid dynamic changes that produce the uh, cavum septum pollutant, for example, in a large number of cases. Ischemia is still a question mark and we'll keep in mind that a lot of the changes are around microtubules. And then finally, blood-brain barrier damage as well that's taking place. Um, so again, I put this up just to be careful. Um, again, incidence and prevalence and connectivity hasn't been fully uh, reported because of the biased population of CTEs are out collecting brains of people that are already damaged. Um, the diagnostic tools are limited, but here's where Amalo comes back in on a paper in November in neurosurgery looking at um, PET scanning with a um, an agent which uh, tends to attach to neurofibrillary tangles of tau protein. And what makes this paper imp uh, important, since it's a single case report, is they have the autopsy of the individual. Uh, an individual um, who played for uh, Minnesota Vikings for a number of years. Uh, his name was uh, Fred McNeil, if anybody knows him from Minnesota. Played for many, many years, and they did a, uh, this um, um, PET scan about four years before, five years before he died, 52 months after, and uh, died of the progressive dementia then developed ALS and died. Um, and what this uh, purports to show is that the deposits um, correlate uh, with the location of the tau uh, protein in the um, uh, autopsy uh, of the brain. So it's the first one where you can connect with the autopsy results and the uh, PET scan results lead to the question, could this be a test uh, that could be helpful in identifying individuals with clinical symptomatology as to whether or not they have uh, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Um, it's certainly not approved yet. The same uh, test system can be used in Alzheimer's disease as well. Okay. So it remains to be seen. Obviously, a full study has to be done. Hmm. I lost something here. Or I pushed the right button. No, I pushed the wrong button. Um, so what are the risk factors? Uh, obviously, repeated head trauma. Concussion is not necessary. Important to keep in mind, although a lot of these people who said they've never been concussed in the past, because of the results of these uh, pathologic studies, weren't well evaluated. Age of onset and duration, as I already mentioned, uh, are important. And probably genetic susceptibility. Uh, again, Hernandez uh, was positive for the uh, Apple E4, the um, um, allele of the gene that puts you at higher risk for uh, developing uh, uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's type, Alzheimer's disease. Um, here's another bit of physics, going back to high school physics. Actually, there's been a book written about this, The Physics of Football. And it comes down to Newton's second law of motion. Force equals mass. Uh, times acceleration. And what's happened to football is from 1920 to 2000, the average weight or mass of alignment in the NFL increased 60% to 300 pounds. In 2011, over here, it's up to 311 pounds. Um, and uh, from 1920 to 2000, because of training and everything else, the average speed acceleration increased by an estimated 12%. So basically, these are very large men who run very fast, who sacrificing their brain for our personal entertainment. Is really what it comes down to. Um, so, how do we prevent it? Okay, uh, with difficulty. Rules changes have helped. If ever any of you watch football, if a defensive player's helmet comes in contact with an offensive player during a tackle, even if it's accidental or casual, he can be removed from the game and has to sit out the next half of the game. Okay. Um, so other rules in terms of, uh, at least in college, they're not allowed to do full pads, uh, impact plays, and so forth. Uh, only uh, It's been limited to a certain amount of, of uh, time per week. Um, where there and strict guidelines, again, the players are being better evaluated. One of the things that needs to be avoided is the SIS, the second um, impact uh, syndrome. If you have a second impact while you're recovering from a concussion, 
uh, it increases the odds of developing um, as yet not fully understood uh, massive cerebral edema and even death. Okay? So these uh, players are kept out, often against their will. Um, the, uh, where there is um, no treatment, of course, uh, the uh, complementary and alternative folks come in because there's money to be made. And quantitative EEG uh, is being now used to determine area of injury. And it's been around since 1970. It's an absolute joke. Okay. Um, the, uh, your Secretary of Education has about $25 million invested in NeuroCore, um, which uh, does qualitative EEG, creates pretty pictures, um, and those pretty pictures then are used uh, for children to design how to do biofeedback, whether you, if you have autism spectrum disorder or uh, other uh, depression, other conditions. Um, if you'll pardon my French, it's just absolute bullshit. Okay. But it is uh, nonetheless a moneymaker. Insurance won't pay for it. Um, and this is another uh, where they're going after NFL players, very inferior way of doing EEG, putting on a cap, um, and then creating through quantitative EEG, I guess, what kind of pictures you look at to make the brain better. Um, this is really the only prevention. Um, uh, mothers don't let your kids play football. And high schools scattered throughout the country, not in huge numbers, are closing football programs because not enough people are showing up. Um, and also, when things like this happen, the lawyers are going to uh, get involved for kids that are injured and so forth. So this is becoming a real issue and one of the things that the NFL is most worried about because not only do they get football players from high school, they get uh, observers, fans from high school. And my last slide, because uh, we have some guilt here, if you'll remember this uh, uh, on our web uh, that began about a week or so before the uh, uh, Super Bowl. We bought four advertisements, and uh, it was announced with great pride, and you can actually watch the advertisements. I think you can still find them. Uh, one of them was for uh, the uh, Neurologic Institute looking at Parkinson's disease, something that football creates. Okay, So I think a real question here kind of ending up on this, uh, does an academic medical center, um, I don't know what I did there, but I did something, does an academic medical center um, sponsor uh, contact sport? I mean, we would never sponsor boxing, because again, that's a, or mixed martial arts, because the purpose there is uh, brain injury. Uh, thanks. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, so should we be doing this? I'll leave that up to, uh, for you all to think about. But obviously, uh, uh, physicians are certainly involved in the sport, and I have no problem with that. I mean, there should be well-schooled physicians on the sidelines as long as this game is being played. Um, will it ever be eliminated? Well, boxing has been around in the United States for, what, 150 years. Uh, professional boxing was a major, major sport in the 20s and 30s and started to uh, move to the side in the 40s. Um, but it's still around, and there's still multi, multi-million dollar boxing matches you can buy to, for on um, um, television um, by access, and it's still here. So uh, with football, there is so much money involved, uh, particularly the NFL is just incredibly, uh, um, uh, incredible amounts of money. But even in college, you know, you go down to Ohio State, they play, uh, they pay their football coaches. Uh, Head coach makes between four and five million dollars a year. That's more than most professors at Ohio State. Even uh, they brought in, I read, a one of the um, line coaches or something paying them a million dollars uh, a year. Uh, and if they win in uh, bowl games and so forth, they get paid more. Uh, so even in college, it's a big money. And um, is uh, something, I think, from a social standpoint, that's relatively new. Again, going back to Michael, uh, Mike Webster's uh, contribution uh, to the understanding of CTE. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. We have time for a couple of questions. So, Dr. Slaughter? So there have been some recent reports of using blood biomarkers for the detection of concussion and the severity of the same uh, to help 
in the management phases, including whether those individuals need imaging studies. Uh, do you think we'll ever, and they, they actually look at release of uh, certain neurofibrillary uh, proteins and also the tau protein. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. I really can't answer that question uh, for several reasons. Smart, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to answer. I don't know. But then there are the social aspects as well. Uh, you know, Phil, why don't I let you, uh, uh, you were good enough to come here. Do you have any comment on that since Phil runs our concussion um, service uh, along with Chris Bailey? Uh, there, is a, there, is, there is development along those lines. and. Uh, uh, I, I will. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on on uh, the biomarkers. I will say that uh, a week from yesterday, we have uh, Joe Maroon, who's one of the prominent uh, people out of Pittsburgh, uh, coming in. Uh, uh, we're going to be meeting uh, all day, uh, or uh, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, for a collaboration on um, a large-scale study, multi-site study of um, biomarkers for. Um, identifying, predicting, um, protecting against. Um, but if I have this, may I make other comments? The, I, I did. So before the group disbands, for sure. One thing I want to get um, get in your uh, hands is uh, the number um, two one six nine eight three play or nine eight three head. That's the uh, the uh, concussion number for UH. Either one of those nine eight three play or nine eight three head. If you have any. Um, any uh, patients that you want um, help with in concussion management, they will direct them uh, accordingly to the um, to the best uh, the best individual for initial management. And then we've got a whole team, interdisciplinary uh, uh, network of um, of experts uh, within the UH system to help with um, assessing and managing. I also just want to make some comments uh, from the standpoint of um, fantastic fantastic presentation, Mike. But I, I, I also don't want our, our colleagues in, in medicine to go away back to their clinics and their patients and, and uh, with the message that, you know, football is going to, or any concussion is going to ultimately lead to uh, early dementia and deterioration and suicide and things like that. Uh, a few, a few um, uh, uh, statistics to put this in perspective is <clears throat> a large study of retired uh, NFL football players a few years ago, 4,000 football players, looking at the rate of dementia within those um, retired NFL football players. Care to guess? What's the rate of dementia in NFL, retired NFL football players? What's that? It's equal. It's the same. It's exactly it's 1%. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I wanted to point out is uh, a lot of this, a lot of the research that the uh, Boston group puts out gets a lot of attention, and they've done great research. But sometimes their studies are uh, get probably more uh, more focus, more emphasis than they're due. <clears throat> um, and I, and this is not a, it's not in any way um, a criticism of you, Mike, because uh, there was that one study that you presented, looking at age, age of exposure to football, age of first exposure, looking at those who were exposed before. Um, age 12 versus after age 12, uh, showing uh, or they concluded that there was a, a significant risk, um, a, a twofold to threefold risk of having severe clinical changes later in life uh, if you had uh, exposure prior to age 12. That was based on. I can uh, study it was, as I say, uh, basically uh, using compute telephone interviews, computerized. Uh, Studies and that kind of thing. Right. So it is tough. I agree. Yeah. So it's two, two, first of all, it's 214 um, uh, individuals. The um, what what is not uh, uh, reported often is that there, in fact, were no cognitive changes, no cognitive differences between the two groups um, on the uh, cognitive testing. And the differences that you're seeing on the um, behavioral measures are the same. A lot of it is like executive behavioral stuff. Well. You know, I'm, I'm a lifespan neuropsychologist, duly trained pediatric and adult geriatric, and uh, a lot of the kids that go into football prior to age 12 are the kind that are rambunctious and, 
and they have ADHD learning disability. There's about about uh, about 45 percent of athletes have uh, ADHD or learning disability or both, and that's what you're seeing with you know executives and that kind of stuff. I've What's not reported? Yeah. My seven-year-old grandson is not playing football. <laughs> that's fine. So there was a that you know, the study you cited that came out uh, last year uh, earlier in the year I think in, in May maybe. In uh, August, there was another study that came out in JAMA Neurology. 4,000 um, athletes, retire, or, or uh, retirement age, um, who had been uh, playing, you know, um, uh, either before, starting before age 12 or after age 12, they were all uh, retired former um, uh, high school and college athletes, as well as many non-athletes. So there were there was like multiple control groups. There was absolutely no relationship in this a much more a much larger study with much better controls designed um, for sport versus non sport contact versus non contact and that kind of thing um, and there was absolutely zero relationship and not not only not significant but it was uh, the, the correlation was like point zero four um, between early exposure to to football versus later exposure to football so just some things and suicide uh, one one last thing. Um, Another frequently cited statistic with regard to CTE and football and that uh, football players um, commit suicide with more frequency um, uh, and it's, and it's uh, tied to the, to the concussions. Uh, the, um, the rate of uh, suicide, this is uh, Gary Solomon just, uh, just uh, uh, presented and published on this about two years ago. The rate of suicide in um, NFL uh, football players is lower than the rate of suicide in physicians. So <clears throat> if we're going to start talking about but restricting they participation. Don't, they, don't, they don't have an electronic medical record. So. <laughs> sorry, they don't have an electronic medical record. <laughs> so we might want to start restricting participation in both of those activities, football and medicine. Yeah. Everything you said is true, but there are certain kind of social things. First of all, there are all these studies. There are a lot of people who have brain damage from playing football. That's number one, and it's a unique pathology. And number two, uh, there's about 250 million of the 700 and I think 50 million dollars that have been assigned um, by the NFL um, to injured players. So, you know, I, I, it, the uh, forget it, the brain is just one structure. The NFL is just not good. You know, you look at what happens to these guys just from a personal They've been as a NFL consultant now for the Browns for 10 years in the NFL. And uh, working alongside of, of a Hank Foyer, I don't know, yeah. Hank or Red, who was on the, um, the uh, head and head committee for years for the, uh, actually still is for the NFL. The NFL, I mean, I, I get it. The business of the NFL is powerful. Um, and they are very motivated to protect their their business. But um, I can tell you that back in the mid '90s, there was a great appreciation for this, um, and, and they uh, uh, that's when they implemented the uh, NFL-wide uh, neuropsychology protocol for managing concussions, and it was very successful for about 10 years. And then the teams started opting out of it because it wasn't mandatory. And then we saw increases in, in concussion, more severe concussions, more severe outcomes from concussions. The NFL, just about three years ago, um, made a new, renewed commitment to this. Now every um, NFL team, again, has an NFL, uh, a neuropsychology consultant, uh, as well as other protections in place for identifying and, and monitoring, managing uh, uh, strict protocols. And it is absolutely mandatory. Every single team is required to have this required to follow the protocol. So they really are, and they've invested a lot of money into um, into uh, research on preventing protection and yeah. so forth as well. So they're they're making efforts. I realize sure. in part they were strong arm sure. Just just because the late hour, I think we you know because it is some of us do have to go. I want to and, and I'll give you the last word. I want to thank you for a really interesting grant. Thank you for your comments. Next year we'll have you guys. You know we'll. we'll be, Give you each half an hour. And, uh, okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah.